of First Peter, but we're also going to be in the book of Isaiah. So if you could put a finger in either one if you want, or we're mostly going to be in Isaiah, and I'll put First Peter on the screen. So Isaiah chapter 6. And over the past three months, we've been taking a deep dive into our mission statement, which is up here on the screen again. So if you want to read it with me. To be a people who embody and proclaim the life-giving fullness of the gospel. And congratulations, you can read sideways and upside down. So that's good. And during the month of March, we've been looking at that uh, since January, but during the month of March, we've looked closely at the third element of that, which is to embody the gospel, to embody the life-giving fullness of the gospel. What does that mean? And so we've taken an even closer look at James chapter 1, verses 26 to 27, where we find here three what I've called indispensable tests of true religion, or what it really means to embody the gospel. And so James says in chapter 1, verse 26, that gracious speech is a key part of that. We talked about this two weeks ago. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. In other words, if you are able to bridle your tongue, if you're able to control your mouth and what you say and and speak graciously for building up others, then then you're a truly, quote-unquote, religious person. You're embodying the gospel Secondly, as we looked at last week, generous love, James 1, 27. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction. In other words, when, we incarnate, when we're incarnationally present and living sacrificially, especially with the most vulnerable people in our communities, we're showing generous love and we are living out true religion. We're embodying the gospel. And then finally today, the last The third of these elements is holy living and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Uh, I've had a bit of fun this week and and in the coming weeks I plan to look even more deeply into the history of this church over the last 150 years. So there's a lot of stuff we have around here, old business meeting minutes and pictures and videos and all sorts of things and it's fun fun to look through it. But this church was started almost 150 years ago, April, I think, 15th or 16th of 1873, 16 community members here in Prineville in what was then Wasco County. I don't know if you knew that or not, but it was Wasco County at the time. 16 members began First Baptist Church here. And according to the minutes, just a couple years later, in 1874, 1875, there was this incident recorded in the meeting minutes of the church where one of these founding members, uh, and I won't name her, was, according to church minutes, quote-unquote, excluded for dancing (laughs) and failure to make satisfaction and for dancing. Okay, so for some reason she was disciplined. I don't know where she was dancing or how she was dancing, if it was in her kitchen or if she was a ballerina, or if she was down at the Grange, or the club, the nightclub, I don't know what they had back here in 1875, but she was excluded from church membership for dancing, and basically failure to make satisfaction. In other words, she wasn't repentant of her dancing. Um, Thankfully, a couple years later, in 1880, this sister was restored to fellowship, which was a good, gracious thing, which is how church discipline is supposed to happen. And then about 25 years later, the same lady ends up in the church minutes, and she wants her name removed from the church membership role. And when asked why, she said, just because I want it that way. So she, I think she was kind of a spunky gal, is what, <laughs> is, what I, is what I'm finding here. But as we read stories like that, you know, we go back 150 years, and we, we kind of chuckle at it. Um, with stories like this because, you know, if you, if you go dancing in Powell Butte with Gabe and Diane, we're not going to kick them out of the church for dancing or that kind of thing. They're, I just threw a wedding for my daughter and son-in-law in September, and there's plenty of dancing there. So we tend to hear those and, and realize that things like that don't usually happen today. We have a different set of um, things that we look through, a different, di- different view of things, maybe a more liberal view of things, you might say, or just different social conventions, And when we talk about something like holiness, like we might think these people were just kind of holier than thou. Maybe they were a bit legalistic or something like that. We tend to think of holiness in a negative way. And we despise people who are sanctimonious, who are kind of goody two-shoes or holier than thou. Right? We're pretty quick to condemn self-righteousness, right? 
which is self-righteousness in itself when you think about it. So whatever happened in our culture to holiness, this idea of being holy, is it, is it a concept that's completely gone by the wayside? Because we can even look at the scriptures. We can open up the gospels and look at Jesus himself. And he didn't seem to be a pretentious goody two-shoes. He came down hard. The people he came down hardest were, were the religious leaders, right? The ones who, who were pretty legalistic and had, had written and added a bunch of rules onto God's law, and yet they failed to live by those rules. So he regularly critiqued those whose lives did not reflect their words. They were hearers of the word, as James would say, but not doers of the word. So Jesus, he condemned hypocrisy. He did not condemn holiness. So perhaps holiness shouldn't have such a negative view. And perhaps it means something other than just priggishness or self-righteousness. Perhaps it means, what holiness means is that we are actually becoming like Jesus, the Holy One. That we're intended to become like him. And that to embody the gospel simply means to become holy or to be holy. That's what embodying the gospel is. So this morning we're going to explore what holiness is. And to do that, we start with God. We must begin with God to understand the importance of holiness. So this morning, we're tur turning in Isaiah 6. But we're also in 1 Peter, where Peter writes this. To these churches, he says, He who called you is holy, in verse 15. So be holy in all your conduct. Why? Because he who called you is holy. So we have to begin with God. In Scripture, God is known as the Holy One. So we consider, if you're there in Isaiah chapter 6, we're going to consider the profound experience of the prophet Isaiah. And here's what it says, starting at verse 1. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. So Isaiah is a priest, and he is also a prophet, and somehow he's in the temple in Jerusalem, serving there or something, and he has this vision. And this is the year that King Uzziah died, and, and Uzziah was, was the king of, his, of Judah for something like 40 years. So it's kind of like Queen Elizabeth dying, right? That's a big deal if you're British. Okay, she's been the king every, during most of every, or queen, she's been the queen. Uzziah would have been the king during most people's entire lives. And now he's died. The king is gone. What do we do? Well, God is showing Isaiah that he's the king. And so he has this vision of this huge throne with, with God on it, the Lord on it, the king on it, and the train of his robe is so big, so majestic, that it fills the entire temple. And then it says, above him stood the seraphim, or these angelic creatures. Each had six wings. With two, he covered his face. With two, he covered his feet. And with two, he flew. And one of these called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. So not just the temple is full of his glory, but the whole earth is full of his glory. He's not just the king of Judah. He's the king of the world. And the foundations of the threshold shook. There's an earthquake now. The whole temple is shaking at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. I mean, you can just imagine this scene. Just this crazy vision that Isaiah has. And God is lifted up as the king. Holy, holy, holy is Yahweh of hosts. Now, the Hebrew language does not contain the ability to add a degree of intensity to an adjective. Now, if I just lost you in, my, in the grammar study here, an adjective is a describing word, right? And in English, we can make adjectives more intense by changing the word. So fast becomes faster and fastest, right? You can be faster, or, or maybe Caleb is faster and Caden is fastest, right? Is that how it works? Okay. You, you understand that. Or we, we can have good, better, or best. So we simply change the word to add a degree of intensity, to make it comparative or to make it superlative. Well, in Hebrew, they don't do that. So instead of saying that something is faster, they would say something like, that thing is really fast, fast. 
Or so-and-so is really good, good. So you just stack words. You repeat words on top of each other. So if something was superlatively good, you wouldn't say it was the best. You would say it was good, good, good. Okay? Now there's only one instance in the Hebrew Old Testament where a superlative stacking of adjectives like this is used with reference to God three times, and it's right here. And it's the word holy. Holy, holy, holy. In other words, God is the holiest. And it's significant that holiness is the only divine attribute, the only divine character trait raised to the third degree, raised to the superlative degree. And it should cause us to consider that perhaps holiness in in relationship to God is the attribute of attributes. It's his, the character trait of character traits for God. It's the, it's the attribute that gives color and shape and form and fullness and meaning to all of God's other attributes. God's holiness is central to who he is. He is holy, holy, holy. Well, what in the world does that mean, though? What is, what is holiness? And we generally think of holiness as a as a moral quality, right? Like purity or, or goodness or good behavior or integrity. But there's actually another more primary biblical meaning to the word holy. The word literally means set apart or separate or others. Something is holy if it's set aside only for a distinct purpose. So you think of the tabernacle or the Ark of the Covenant or, or the altar in the Old Testament. These things were set apart as holy only to be used for a specific purpose. So holiness then primarily refers, in, in God's instance, to utter his utter transcendence, his utter, utter otherness, his majesty. So Moses sang in Exodus chapter 15, saying, Who is like you, O Yahweh, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? And and obviously Moses is asking a rhetorical question. The answer to this question is, no one, no one is like Yahweh. There is no one like Yahweh. God, he's completely separate, completely different, completely transcendent. There's no one or nothing like him in the universe. He's absolutely unique and utterly without equal. That's his holiness. God is holy, holy, holy. So so we have to keep that kind of definition in mind, that he is completely other, completely different, completely unique. Keep that in mind as you consider the secondary definition of holiness which is the one that we usually think of, and it's moral purity or perfection. According to Jerry Bridges, God's holiness is perfect freedom from all evil. As Habakkuk says in chapter 1 of his little prophetic book, Are you not from everlasting, O Yahweh, my God, my Holy One? You who are of purer eyes than to see evil... And cannot look at wrong. So God's holiness then encompasses his absolute otherness, his separateness from everything else, his perfect purity, and really the totality of his whole character. Ultimately, holiness matters because God is holy. That's why holiness matters, because God is holy. But then in light of that, we do have to take a look at ourselves. And the Isaiah narrative in chapter 6 continues like this in verse 5. And I, Isaiah, said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, Yahweh, of hosts. So so see what happens here. He's just had this vision of grandeur, of of God on his throne in the temple. And the first thing that Isaiah does is to call a curse down upon himself. Woe to me. Starkly and suddenly, Isaiah is confronted with his own uncleanness. 
So he calls a curse down on himself. And as the King James Version says, he says, I am undone. Literally, I am taken apart. I'm falling apart. I have been unclothed. So the carefully constructed self that Isaiah has built for himself to show to the world all these fig leaves that he has put on himself to cover up his sin and his nakedness have been removed. He's been unraveled and he's been left stark naked before the holy other, pure, all-seeing eyes of the holy God. He has nowhere left to hide. He's been outed for who he truly is, a sinful, unclean man, unworthy of laying his eyes on the king. And this is what God's holiness does. When we're confronted with God's holiness, it exposes our sin. It brings it to light. It calls us to account. But if we're honest with ourselves, we are what you might call sin minimizers. In fact, let's not even use that ugly, kind of archaic, pretty judgmental word, sin. Like, who wants to use that word? It's kind of old-fashioned, right? Let's not use that word. We don't want to talk about sin. I'd rather much talk about, I'd rather talk about, hey, mistakes were made, right? Maybe I have some weaknesses or some foibles or some eccentricities or bad habits, but not sin. I mean, who wants to talk about sin, Well, sorry, fellow sin minimizers, because that's exactly what we're going to do for a few minutes here. Place sin and all of its ugliness and all of its weightiness before us and consider what it actually is in light of God's holiness. I'll put a quote up here on the screen from theologian Cornelius Plantinga, and he writes this. He says, The Bible presents sin by way of major concepts, principally lawlessness and faithlessness, expressed in an array of images. Sin is the missing of a target, a wandering from the path, a straying from the fold. Sin is a hard heart and a stiff neck. Sin is blindness and deafness. It is both the overstepping of a line and a failure to reach a line. It's both transgression and shortcoming. Sin is a beast crouching at the door. In sin, people attack or evade or neglect their divine calling. These and other images suggest deviance. And when it is familiar, even when it is familiar, sin is never normal. Sin is disruption of created harmony and then resistance to divine restoration of that harmony. Above all, sin disrupts and resists the vital human relation to God. And it does all this disrupting and resisting in a number of intertwined ways. Sinful life is a partly depressing, partly ludicrous caricature of genuine human life. And that should be sobering. And the reason I read the quote is because he said a lot better than I could. And if we don't take sin seriously, here's the deal. If we don't take sin seriously, then we don't take God seriously. We have too far, far too small a view of sin because we have far too small a view of God. And because God is perfectly and infinitely holy, sin is even more serious than we can imagine. It is infinite. And God, listen to this, God hates it. He hates sin because sin is an offense to his very character. And the vast majority of people, including Christians, desperately need to be awakened to God's holiness. We need to be confronted with the ugly weight of our own sin. But because we cannot carry the weight of our own sin, Because it's too heavy for us. Even for one minute to carry it, what we do is we talk ourselves into thinking that it's not a big deal. We ignore it. We justify it. We pass blame and point the finger. Or we become adept at avoiding having to deal with our sins, so we maybe brush it under the rug. But when we do this, we actually end up avoiding God and treating Him with contempt. 
and refuse, refusing to allow him to deal with our sin. Have you ever said something like this? You know what? God's already taken care of all my sin on the cross. So thankfully, he'll forgive this sin that I'm about to willingly commit. We think that in our hearts. Jesus took care of it already, so it's not a big deal, right? Plus, isn't, isn't he so loving and so forgiving? He'll understand. But according to the Bible, someone who has truly experienced God's forgiveness, God's forgiveness, which was won for you through the violent death of his son Jesus on the cross, Someone who's truly experienced that forgiveness will run away from sin rather than remaining in sin or running towards sin. If you're willing to coddle your sin like a a kitty or a puppy or something, if you're willing to coddle or, or just even overlook your sin, that willingness, that willingness to overlook it should serve as a warning sign that something is not right in your heart. If you're doing whatever you want and presuming upon God's forgiveness, perhaps you fully haven't fully understood how offensive sin is to God. In 1692, an English Puritan pastor by the name of Walter Marshall eloquently confronted this, this very propensity of us to presume upon God's forgiveness. And so speaking of people who do that, here's what he said. They would have their sins forgiven, not that they may walk with God in love in time to come. And picture that for a moment. Walking with God in love, in heaven, walking within his presence, and having your sins forgiven so that you can be with God. So they would have their sins forgiven, not that they may walk with God in love in time to come, but that they may practice their enmity against him without any fear of punishment. God is offended by sin because sin is ultimately against him. It's contrary to his character and it's in opposition to what he created us for and who he created us to be. Sin is the ultimate act of enmity and rebellion against our holy creator. And if we're Christians, it's also the ultimate act of ingratitude and hostility towards our Father. Whether you are his child or his enemy, God will judge every sin impartially. And 1 Peter takes us back here in verse 17, chapter 1. And if you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile. Conduct yourself with fear. Even as a follower, even as a child of God, God would judge impartially. So walk in fear. Walk in that that same trembling fear that Isaiah would walk in. You know, if sin were not such a big deal to God, why would he send his beloved son to pay for it? As Peter goes on to say, you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Can you think of anything that would pay for your sin that is more precious than the Son of God and His blood? Nothing. The precious blood of Christ paid for your sin like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. It's no small thing that God the Father gave what was most precious to him and God the Son willingly took on suffering, bleeding, dying for our sins. The cross is the ultimate picture of the ugly weight of our sin and the holiness of God. And every time we sin, It's almost like we pick up the lash and hit Christ back again. We willfully throw more punishment on him for our sake. But if we love Jesus, even the thought of that should grieve us. How could we willingly do such a thing? But our proper response to sin, far from condoning it or continuing in it, should be somber, serious, fearful hatred 
And you're not often going to hear a preacher tell you to hate things. But God hates sin, and so should we. Psalm 97, verse 10. Oh, you who love Yahweh, hate evil. Proverbs 8, 13. The fear of Yahweh is hatred of evil. Amos 5, 15. Hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gate. Or as Jerry Bridges has written, as we grow in holiness, we grow in hatred of sin. And God, being infinitely holy, has an infinite hatred of sin. And so we're called, brothers and sisters, to pursue holiness. We continue there. We go back to verse 14 of 1 Peter 1. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am. Am holy. The Apostle Paul in, in Ephesians chapter 5 says something very similar. Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. And so we are. We're obedient children. We're, we're beloved children. We're sons and daughters of the King. We're sons and daughters of God. And we're called to embody the gospel as God makes us more and more like his son Jesus. That is, as he makes us more and more holy. Which is kind of a big deal when you think about it because God is holy. He's completely other. And we can never be God, but in Christ, we are called to look and to act like Him. It's an astounding reality that we could be called holy. It's also impossible in ourselves. But here's where the gospel truly has teeth. So let's return to our friend Isaiah in Isaiah 6. We left him basically completely unraveled and undressed and undone in the temple, confronted with God's holiness. And here's what happens in verse 6. Then one of the seraphim, one of these six-winged flying angels, these creatures, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. So this this red-hot coal from the altar. And he touched my mouth. Imagine that for a second. Having your mouth touched with a burning hot red coal would hurt. Touched my mouth. And and remember also that the mouth was the the place of the body that that Isaiah said, that's the sinful part of me. I'm a man of unclean what? Unclean lips. And I live amongst a people of unclean lips. And he touched Isaiah's mouth with this coal. And here's what he said. Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away. Your sin atoned for. So in the presence of God's holiness, Isaiah is confronted with his sin. He stands guilty, he stands judged, he stands condemned. He calls a curse on himself. But God steps in, in his sin, in his brokenness, in his utter inability to do anything for himself. God steps in to provide cleansing, to provide forgiveness, to provide atonement for Isaiah's sin, and he does the same for us. So God gives us what's first called, what theologians call positional holiness. This is not something that we create. It's not something that we go to God and we we make a deal with him and we negotiate it out. It's not something we work really hard to achieve for ourselves. This is completely a gift, and it's only given to us through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And I had no idea that Jonas was going to read this verse earlier. He had no idea I was going to preach on it today. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake, God, the Father, made him, Jesus, the Son of God, to be sin, who knew no sin. Perfect Son of God, completely pure, holy, sinless. God made him to be sin. Think of all of your worst sins and the ones you don't even want to think about, the ones you never want to talk about, the never, ones you'll never tell anyone about. All those Jesus became for you. Made him to become sin who knew no sin so that in him we might become what? The righteousness of God. So this great exchange happens at the cross. When we put our faith in Christ, he takes our sin, becomes sin for us, takes our punishment, and what do we get? We get the imputed righteousness of God. 
We get the holiness of God so that when God looks at us, if you're a follower of Christ by faith, when God looks at us, he sees his sinless, righteous son. You are holy because you've been given the holiness of Jesus. God looks at you as if you've never committed sin because you are in Christ and you are made right with God and free from the power of condemning sin. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are where? In Christ Jesus. Amen? Amen. You're now a saint. So the New Testament calls believers Christians, they call, calls them holy ones, saints. You're now a holy one. You're a son or daughter of the king. And there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do to lose it. It's yours. You're positioned in Christ as holy. But God partners with us in progressive, what, I call, what theologians call progressive holiness. We're positionally holy. We're in him but we're progressively becoming holy. We stand holy, but we're also becoming holy. We still sin. None of us is perfect. No one on this earth is a finished product. We're still all in process. And this is where we're called to partner with God. And he gives us the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of holiness, the Spirit who makes holy so that we might become holy as He is holy. The only way we can become more like Jesus is with the empowerment of the indwelling Holy Spirit, the gift sent from the Father and the Son, the third person of the Trinity given to us to make us like Jesus. And our job is simply to partner with the Spirit in pursuing holiness and becoming more like Jesus by putting to death the indwelling sin that remains with us and will remain with us in this world. Now, what does all this mean for us? First thing, I just want to give you four things as we close. The first thing is that holiness matters. Holiness matters. And holiness matters because God matters. And our holiness matters because if we're followers of Jesus, if we've put our faith in him, we're his, we're his sons and daughters. We're beloved, obedient children. And our holiness matters because we're his representatives. We carry his family name into the world. And embodying the gospel means that we image him forth in our, in our communities and at our workplaces, in our schools, wherever we're at. You see, God has set us apart. That's the first definition of holiness. God has set us apart and in doing so, he's making us holy like Jesus. So the question is, is when people look at us, when they look at you, when they look at me, do they see Jesus? Because holiness matters. The second truth I want us to walk out of here with is this fact that God provides what he requires. And this is perhaps one of the most beautiful truths we will ever hear. Memorize it. Think about it. Write it in the front of your Bible. Write it on your mirror at home. Write it on your forehead. I don't know. God provides what he requires. This is the gospel hope for us today. God never asks anything of us that he does not also freely give to us. He doesn't ask us to do anything that he doesn't give us the power to do. He's made us positionally holy in Jesus, and he is making us more like Jesus through the power of his Spirit. And we can either resist the Spirit in that, or we can partner with the Spirit in that. All the heavy lifting has been done by Jesus. Now we are free to do what God wants us to do, to be holy. The third piece here is a more communal piece, and it's simply that the part affects the whole. And this could be really an entire sermon series on its own, but the idea here is that your sin doesn't stop with you. No matter if it's hidden, no matter if no one will ever know about it, your sin doesn't stop with you. It affects others like a virus as well. And as a church, we're only as strong as our weakest link. Unconfessed, hidden sin will affect us all. Even if nobody ever knows about it, it will affect us all all and in the same way the best way to fight sin is not to do it as a lone ranger the best way to fight sin is to do it in community with brothers and sisters who love us 
and who want what's best for us and who will ask us hard questions and who will pray for us and lift us up and support us and restore us with gentleness when we need it. The part affects the whole. The church as a whole is important. Your holiness matters to me. My holiness matters to you. And the last thing, we've been praying for snow and rain, but we've also been praying for the Holy Spirit to fall down and bring revival in this place. And I'll just say this, that revival begins always with repentance. If any kind of revival is going to happen in our hearts, in our church, in our community, it must start with repentance. But repentance can only take place where sin is recognized, where it's confessed, where it's grieved over, And sin will only be recognized, confessed, and grieved over when God's holiness is taken seriously. When we're confronted with a holy God before whom we cannot stand without His Son, Jesus. And so revival must start with the stark realization of our sin, which means that we have to look to God. That we have to exalt and lift up His holiness. We have to come to Him with honest and open hearts, ready for him to to shine his holiness on us, that we might not just suffer, not that we might just be condemned, so that we might be forgiven and changed. So as we come to the Lord's table today, we remember what we've talked about this morning, the sacrifice of Christ. We remember his giving his body and his broken body and his poured out blood on our behalf and for our sake. And so as you come this morning, I would pray that you would come with a heart ready for light to be shown on it, ready to confess what needs to be confessed to him, bring up what needs to be brought up to him. And if you need to meet with somebody to talk about that this morning, I know the prayer room's gonna be open. You can talk back there. I think Marlene's in there or talk to somebody you're with. Confess your sins to one another that you may be healed. And as you come also, not just for confession, but for healing, I pray that that Jesus would just, I don't know, just bathe you in his forgiveness and his grace this morning, and that he would empower you again with his Holy Spirit to go from here, to live holy lives and embody the gospel, depending completely on him at all times. Father, We pray for you, we pray this morning for you to give us the grace of your spirit poured out on us. We pray as we come and we partake of this bread which which reminds us of the broken body of Christ, the scourged body of Christ, the the body with, with nail holes in the wrists and in the feet, the body with puncture wounds in the scalp from a crown of thorns, the body with 39 open wounds in the back because of the lashes that you took for us. As we think of your body and your blood poured out, we take of this bread and this cup. God, we are humbled. We pray that none of us would take it lightly, that we would not just presume that you did all this so that we could just keep on sinning and rebelling against you, but you did it to make us new. You did it to redeem us, to buy us back. You did it to give us the life that you created us for. So God, we revel in that new life this morning. We revel in that grace this morning. And we revel in your holiness this morning. Lord, may we not be afraid to pray with David that you would reveal in us any unclean way and lead us in the life everlasting. So Spirit, have your way with us. Bring revival here through our repentance. May it start in our hearts. Father, do your will. Have your way with us, we pray. Amen.